good morning out there. It's great to see y'all this morning. Welcome all of you visitors to Williams. If you are a visitor, we would love for you to fill out your information on this sheet of paper in the bulletin. It flaps back and forth and rip it out and put it in the offering plate when it comes your way in a few minutes. Just want to have a record of your visit because we love you visitors. And um, the rest of you grab your bulletins and join in with me and looking on all the great stuff going on this week. All right. Um, tonight, make sure that you come back at 6 o'clock. We have our worship, which is just so fun and neat. And if you haven't come yet, get on over here at 6 o'clock because it is just such a great experience. So come tonight, 6 o'clock. All right, there will be a meeting following the service this morning. The Daycare and Building and Grounds Committee will meet right after this service this morning, I believe up here in the front. So if you're part of the Daycare, Building and Grounds um, Committee, please meet. All right, Brotherhood will meet this Saturday. You'll have breakfast at 7 o'clock. Now, following this breakfast, all of you brothers, you are going to go out on a mission trip, um, do some yard work, some uh, stuff. Wendell can give you all of the details, but um, if you aren't able to make it to breakfast, they might be leaving around 9 o'clock. So if you are interested in this, please see Wendell, and he will tell you all about that this Saturday at 7 o'clock. Um, something else cool going on this week, Bible school. Woo! So excited. All you kids, give a yahoo, finally. All right, Bible school this week starts in the morning at 8.30, and it will end at 11 o'clock, Monday through Thursday. Um, and we need the kids to do something every day. They need to bring a water bottle. Empty water bottle needs the cap. This is for um, a little craft they will do uh, on in the week. But just kids bring water bottles this week. But um, if you would like to help out for Bible school, we need it. Please come by. We'll put you to work leading the crews around, putting you in a spot. You will be um, put to work and in great need. So just know if you have nothing to do this week, help us out at Bible school. And we will not have service this Wednesday due to Bible school. So y'all may spend time with your families during that time. All right, I hope I got everything. I think I did. All right, so now let's just stand. Give someone a hug, shake a hand, or say good morning. Good morning. Good, that's not bad for Sunday morning. Well, it's time to do what we do best, sing and worship. It's good to see you today. Let me encourage you to get your hymn book just a moment. Look at 488 and hold on to it. The choir's going to do a little opening. God is good. I'll turn around and you'll sing that he keeps me singing with us. You'll sing the first and the fourth stanza. I'll have you to stand, and when you finish singing, you'll be seated in the choir finish out the song. So you be, you be primed and ready to go. Well, 488, he keeps me singing.
Amen. amen. Man, I hadn't heard a good amen in a long time. God is good all the time. Well, when the last time you got up on Monday morning, I think I'll just go down to Albania and go to work. You ever thought about it? Where is Albania, by the way? Does anybody know where that is? It's not in North Alabama, South Alabama. That's a long way from home, folks. We have missionaries that do things and go places that you and I would never really get to go. Maybe not even know where they're at on the map. Several things we can do. The main thing we can pray for. That's the most thing that most missionaries ask for, is prayer. Go if we give our monies, which helps a lot. Our mission moment of the day uh, concerned the family in the Albania area. It's a, it's a porta. It's a house in Athens, Greece, and it's scheduled to, uh, it's been over for about a year. It's a hospitality and ministry center. It's in, encouraging from Albania and immigrants and families that work in Porta for the CBF personnel. Now, the family is Bob and Janice Newell. Remember that name, Bob and Janice Newell. They provide spiritual enrichment, artistic development, language learning, and legal assistance for the Albanian immigrants in Greece. Let's just don't let this be a thing on Sunday morning. Okay? This is a lifelong commitment. These are people that took Jesus serious when he said, follow me. Let's just pray for them all week, okay? If you remember that name, just the Newells. You all may remember the Newell name. If you would do that this week and remember them in, in your prayers because these are special people. Um, Miss Peggy Hamby, I'm going to ask you, ma'am, if you would, to word our prayer for our missionaries this morning. Would you do that for us, please, ma'am? Jesus Christ 
and all be saved and be cleansed of our sins. But on top of that, what made it even better was he was buried in a tomb. See the tomb that he was buried in right there? He was buried in a tomb. However, the greatest thing that happened on the third day, he rose from the tomb. You see, he rose, he rose, and, uh, He's sorry, Mr. Norton, where are you? He's risen from the tomb. He just passed that. I know Mr. Norton's up. Mr. Norton's face just turned real red at that point. But he rose from the tomb, and he, because of that, because of his death and his burial and his resurrection, each one of us have eternal life. And what it opens up now, and get it to open right, there we go. There. Through his shedding his blood, he is the only way to get to heaven. And through that, you see the cross there, and the cross, and the shedding of his precious blood. Each one of us can become a Christian. And becoming a Christian, we will go, we can go to heaven and we can enjoy the glories of salvation and be with Jesus. And because of that, God reaches down his hand to each and every one of us today, everybody here, to let us know that he loves us and he filled the gap between heaven and hell. Because of Christ coming and dying on the cross for our sins and being buried and risen on the third day, each one of us, God's hand is down, it's waiting. And one day, the Lord will touch your heart and you will come to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And then the final thing is this, if I can get over here. How do you live a Christian life? Very good. Through your heart, through prayer, through Bible study, through fellowship, and through Jesus Christ, you live a Christian life. So this week in Vacation Bible School, you're going to study about Jesus Christ. And just remember, He came and gave His life for each and every one of you. Okay? Now, here's the thing. The reason I'm doing this is in a couple of weeks, I'm going to do something and I'm going to give you a cross. Okay, so two, a couple of weeks from now, you will get a cross from me. Okay? And every time you look at that cross, I want you to know Jesus Christ died for your sins. Okay? Good morning. Y'all have a good day. Thank you, Randy. Makes you proud, don't it, D? Makes you proud, don't it, man? Standing joke. I heard a rumor this morning. Probably not a rumor. It's probably the truth. I heard Jake Green was selected outstanding senior at Pleasant Valley High School this year. Now, do y'all believe that? If you believe it, clap. Good job. Chris Britton said it was rigged. <laughs> Congratulations, buddy. Proud of you guys. Proud of all our seniors. Proud of you. That's, that's, that's very good to be recognized among your friends and all. Where's your hope this morning? I hope it's in Jesus. I hope it's on the rock. I hope it's on the rock. My hope is built on nothing less. Hymn number 404. Off we tour hymn. Morning, we're going to sing all four stanzas. All four stanzas. Stand with us, please, as we sing.
Today our scripture comes from the Gospel of Matthew, if you'd like to turn over to chapter 7. But before we, uh, we read the scripture together, I wanted to uh, remind everybody that tomorrow is the beginning of Vacation Bible School. It's an annual event here at our church that's uh, very important and probably goes back deep in, in all of our memories. Uh, many of us have been to Bible school as children and can remember the taste of the Kool-Aid and the cookies. Uh, and the stories and how they were told, the pictures that were presented to us. Red Rover, Red Rover. You ever play that at Bible school? We did that a lot. It's gotten a little more creative, uh, a little more fancy over the years. And uh, the talent of our uh, teachers helps make all that possible, and I appreciate them very much. And I wanted to pray for them this morning as we commission them. Bible school is a great opportunity for our kids to learn uh, about the Lord. There's like, I should be praying with music or something right now. I don't know. But if you're teaching and you're working with Bible school, would you please stand so we could recognize you this morning? Somebody's got to be doing it, I know. <laughs> okay, there they go. All right, anybody else? Okay. All right, and children, if you're planning to be at Bible school or youth, you're going to be helping with Bible school, would you stand so we could see you? I know somebody's going. All right. We'll have a big group tomorrow, I'm pretty sure. Let's have just a moment and pray, and I'd like for you to think about the folks who did stand, and there are some others that didn't, who I know are going to help. But if you'll just lift them up in prayer right now, then I'll close us in just a moment. Lord, we thank you so much for the opportunity to pray for these people who are dedicating their time this week. Vacation Bible School. Is a time for our kids to learn how much you love them. And we pray, Lord, that through the words of the Bible and the stories and the fellowship and the food and the crafts and all those things that make it up, that you would keep our kids safe and our workers in your care. Thank you for them. And we pray, Lord, that you just allow your light to shine in such a way that those who need to hear about you will hear about you in a very powerful way. It's part of our spiritual formation here at the church. And we pray, God, that you would just assist that process because we know that we can't do it without you. So bless our Bible school. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Okay. Let's turn now to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 7. These are the last words of the Sermon on the Mount that began in chapter 5 of Matthew. Begin in verse 21, where Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many deeds of great power in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Go away from me, you evildoers. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on rock. The rain fell, the floods came, and the wind blew and beat on that house. But it did not fall because it had been founded on rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house. And it fell, and great was its fall. Now when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were astonished at his teaching for he taught them as one having authority and not as one of their scribes. This is God's word for us this morning.
I told Roy, I said, well, now we know who's going to follow you no matter what. You know, <laughs> they said, sit down, we're going to sit down. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, the parable that concludes the Sermon on the Mount is uh, one that a lot of us know. It's, uh, it's very fitting for our children's story. The rains came down, the floods came up, and the house that was built on rock stood up to all the storm that came. What Jesus is saying is, in the parable, I think, that everybody, whether you know it or not, is a builder. And all of us are building a house, which is our lives. Everybody's building a life. And your life is built by the way you conduct yourself. Your life is your character. It's your personality. It's who you are inside. And it's based on the things that you do and the things that you say. And even the things that you think, your attitude, even remember stories, Jesus looking and saying, I know what you're thinking, and your heart is very important to me. The other truth, I think, in this parable that Jesus is telling us is that every house, every life will face a storm. Everybody will face a storm. And there are some, apparently, from the story just before it, who think that they are wisely building their house, their lives, in such a way that they can withstand any storm and that they're going to be okay. They're wisely being the kind of people that God's asked them to be. And yet it's very disturbing to hear the words that preface the parable of the two builders. The words go like this. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, to me will be able to make it. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will I even know and he, at the end, he says some very disturbing words. I don't know you, so get out of here. That's a scary thought, isn't it? These are the concluding words that Jesus gives us. Now, what I want to do then is to encourage us all to think about how we're building our lives. And when you think about the things that you and I do, probably everybody in the building today would say, I've said those words, Lord, Lord. And maybe you think you believe them. Hopefully you do. But let's just check. Let's just see how we're doing. One of the things I think that we need to be aware of is that you can't really get to know somebody with a casual acquaintance. If you run into somebody every once in a while at, at, the, at the Walmart or at a ball game at, at the school over here, you could say, if somebody said, well, do you know Joe Smith? Well, yeah, I know Joe Smith. I've seen him at the store, and I've seen him at the ball game. I think he's got a kid, plays basketball, number 34 or something like that. But I can't really tell you honestly that I know Joe Smith, if that's the only kind of hit and miss meetings that I have with Joe. Does that make sense? You can't really know somebody unless you have a deeper relationship with them. And that's why for years and years Christians have insisted that you must go beyond a confession of what you believe. The Bible even tells us that the demons admit that Jesus is Lord, Lord. They will confess that He's the boss, the leader, and the most powerful one, the most powerful power in the universe. And yet they don't, in their hearts, know Him as Lord, Lord. So what I want to encourage you to think about is where you are in your relationship building with Jesus Christ. Where are you in understanding and knowing Jesus, so that at no point in your future will it be said by Jesus, you don't know me, and I don't know you. What are you doing to build those relationships? You remember the story of the little kid who was drawing a picture in Sunday school, and the teacher was saying, you know, what are you drawing, Johnny? And he says, I'm drawing a picture of God. You all remember that? And she says, you know, nobody's ever seen God. How can you draw a picture of him? He says, well, when I finish, we'll know exactly what he looks like. You know, remember that? I like that little story. And, and really, as funny as that is, everybody's doing that. You're doing that too. You've, you're drawing a picture of an image of God in your heart. Everybody has that. Either God's a king or you've drawn a picture of him by your relationship to him where he's distant. He watches you, maybe from a distance. Or he's a close friend, or he's a scary God. You know, I don't know, but everybody's got a picture. I think it'd be good for you to take that picture out and look at it. Everybody is drawing. And I want to ask you, what kind of picture 
you have of your God? What kind of picture do you hold of God in your heart? There was a famous theologian named Karl Barth who years ago, he'd written all these books and dogma and different doctrines and a very intelligent and brilliant and devout uh, follower of God. And somebody interviewed him one time when he was in America and said, you know, tell us just basically what you believe. And he said, uh, Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. It's a great theological statement, isn't it? Now, he'd been drawing a picture of God in his heart, even though he's able to express it in ways way beyond my intelligence. And he drew that picture, and he had it in there in a very simple statement and probably something that he learned early on. What I want to ask you to do is just check and see how your picture is developing of God. Check on your relationship and how well you really know Lord, Lord in your life. And probably all of us could say, we need to do a little work there. We could probably do more to get to know our Lord. So I want to encourage you to create experiences. And I'll say this to you. If you don't do this, you will be in a more superficial relationship to the Lord Jesus. If you don't intentionally do things to try to get to know Jesus, then obviously you won't be able to know Him well. It's just common sense. This is not brain surgery. So create experiences in your life and be attentive to those. Be intentional about building those. And let me just give you some ideas of how you can do that. The Bible says that where two or three are gathered together in a spiritual way in my name, there I'll be also. Now you can do that in church. And so one of the things you can do is to be sure that you get yourself in place that you're in the congregation of God's people. The Bible says, Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together in my name. Some of you won't live here in five or ten years, but you will have a group of Christians somewhere. And if not, start one. Gather yourselves together, because in the midst of that is where many, many times we get to know Jesus, because we're around Jesus' people. And we've heard that Jesus is in the midst of us when we pray and seek Him and gather together in church. Sunday school is a good way to do that. You develop close relationships with each other. And I've heard that often said. We're going to talk about Sunday school here coming up in this year. And emphasize that more because the building of relationships is important. But I would say to you the most important relationship you build is the relationship between you and your Lord Jesus. And in Sunday school, where you are exposed more to the Bible and the opinions and ideas of others, and two or three of you are gathered, you have an opportunity to get to know Jesus better in a way that probably you wouldn't do if you just tried to do it by yourself. Service. Jesus asked us to come alongside Him and do things in His name to work with Him to try to help build the kingdom in the world, to bring it to those who are needy and hurting and so forth. And when you serve and work beside somebody, you get to know them better. When you work and do some common goal-oriented thing together, you become like a team, a part of something that's important, and you care about the one at your right hand and the one at your left hand. So come alongside Jesus and do the things that you think you can do with your gifts and your talents. Prayer and Bible study. Many, many of us can attest of meeting and knowing God better because we make an appointment every day to talk to Him and to listen. Prayer is a two-way conversation. Expressing what we feel and what we need and what we hope and what we dream, our supplications, asking for something, and then listening and seeing what God might lay on our hearts and settle on us. And reading the Bible and listening to the words of God so that we read these words and listen for a message to you and to me from the words that God inspired so many years ago. Martin Luther said that for him, at least, God appeared mostly incognito, which means in disguise. And so he was able, he said, to try to look harder since he knew God was there and in his midst, but wouldn't just flash out and say, here I am, but would just be in there, that he had to look harder. And he said for him that he found God often in the widow who asked for bread, 
There was a widow near where he lived, and she was poor and in need and often depended on the support of good people. And he found Jesus with her and in her. In an orphanage in his town where children who were either abandoned or lost their families were being raised in a group home setting, there he found Jesus. And you think about it. Where is God for you today? In, in my past, at least, I can say that I can remember knowing about God and sensing His presence because my grandparents taught me about it. They told me stories about Jesus, Bible stories, faith stories, personal stories. I saw them pray, and I can remember sensing the feeling that maybe God is real because of that. Good Christian friends who've come alongside me before, whose confidence in God was strong when my confidence was weak. And that helped me to feel like God is real, and I began to know Him better and understand how He works in this world. Unless your name is Saul, later Paul, and you're traveling a Damascus road right now, you're probably just an ordinary Christian. And being an ordinary Christian, you don't need to be looking for burning bushes. You don't need to be listening for loud voices or blinding lights that will knock you off your horse, although some of you need that. You mostly are going to experience God in your everyday living. And you'll be like the disciples. You know, when I was growing up, I thought the disciples were all these guys that were just, just doing their work, and Jesus just walked through their life one day, and they dropped everything and followed Him. But reading the Gospel of John more closely and just studying these disciples with our senior adults on Tuesdays helped me learn and re-examine that most of these disciples didn't just sort of one day live their life and the next day meet Jesus and boom, it all changed. Many of them had put themselves in places to be blessed. Put themselves in position for God to reveal Himself more clearly to them. You remember the first disciples. John says, Andrew was a friend and maybe a follower of John the Baptist. He was already a seeker looking for God in the world. And he attached himself with John the Baptist. He liked the message, repent for the kingdom of God is close to you. And he stuck over there and maybe he had been baptized by John. Maybe he'd seen people's lives change. And being involved in that made him more aware. One day, Jesus walks by and John says, Look, there goes the Lamb of God. And Andrew says, i got to go follow him. And he starts following him and Jesus turns around and says, What do you want? And he says, I don't really know for sure, but I'd like to find out. He says, Well, come follow me and see what you see. And then he comes at some point, Andrew, to go get his brother, Peter, the rock, and he says, we found him. We found the Messiah. Come and see for yourself. Now he's saying that because he'd been seeking it. He knew what he was looking for. He was looking for God. He was looking for God's help and God's presence in the world. If you don't try to create spaces for God in your busy life, you make it harder to experience the reality of the Holy One in your living. You've got to make yourself unfold. Open your heart. Open your mind. Open your eyes, your ears, and your soul to God. He really will find you. But if you do this, you will be able to say, look what I found. There was God beside me all along. There was a man in 1956 who went in that time period to some of the unreached tribal people in South America named Jim Elliott. There were three of them in particular who were killed in their encounter. They went to this tribe. It was a very different culture from them. And in the process, they had a good start but ended up being killed. And they were actually shot with these poison darts. And it killed them. And this guy, Jim Elliott, wrote about this. And I think what he talks about here is very important and experiencing God. He wrote in his journal that they found, he said, one day, he said, I walked out on a hill just now. It's exalting, delicious to stand embraced by the shadows of a friendly tree 
with the wind tugging at your coattail and the heavens hailing your heart to gaze and glory and give oneself again to God, what more could a man ask? Oh, the fullness, pleasure, sheer excitement of knowing God on earth. I care not if I never raise my voice again for Him, if only I may love Him and please Him, if only I may see Him, touch His garments and smile into His eyes. What's he talking about? Desire. He's talking about desire. He wants, more than anything else, to know God. And that's where it needs to start. Desire to know Jesus. A desire to know when you say it with your lips, Lord, Lord, what that truly means to you, not to me or to any Karl Barth or theologian, but to you. To know what it means to say, Lord, Lord, and to sometimes say it in such a way that your heart trembles and you need to bend your knees and get down in prayer because you feel like you're in the presence of your Lord, Jesus. And it touches you. And every day maybe becomes a day that you feel like you're walking with God. He's walking with you and no matter what storm comes your way and what experience you have to face, you feel like He's there because you become accustomed to the presence. I come to the garden alone and the voice I hear. You remember that? It's your beloved. It's the one you care about who's been with you all along and loves you very much. Still, I will say this. God will often come to you when you least Expect it because God can't be calendared. God will not be scheduled. So look out and look up because He will come to you. Incognito, often. But on occasion, it will slap you straight in the face. And you will know the Lord your God. Now the other side of this coin, I think, for Jesus is this. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will I know because they don't do a darn thing that I ask them to do. And that's sort of the way this story follows. So one side of this is to say, Lord, Lord, and you can say that and you know that and you can even sing the song, I, Jesus loves me, this I know for the Bible tells me so. And you got that down, but you don't know them in your heart because you're not giving them any space. You're not trying to create and put yourself open so God could touch your life and so you could say He's a trusted friend, a mighty God, a wonderful Savior. Now the other side of it is, Jesus will say, you may be able to confess with your mouth, Lord, Lord, and you know all the right answers, but since you don't do what I ask you to do, you're not really treating me as your boss, as your Lord. If you say, Lord, Lord, and you mean Lord, Lord, you need to act like He's your Lord, Lord. There are things you must do if He is your boss. There are things you must think and say if He is your boss. Listen to the call stories of people like the missionaries we heard. Listen to them when they come in December and other times of the year and share. Listen to what they say. Always it will be consistently these elements. The initiation of God into a life that was unfolding and ready for God. They were already usually feeling that their lives that they had, something was amiss and they're usually getting more and more involved in the center of the life of their godly church. And in that, they will hear a calling, an initiation of God. And then this is the last thing, there will be a response. There will have to be some kind of response. So anytime you get somebody that talks about a calling of God on their lives, listen to what they did about it. They had to do something about it. Samuel Morris, who invented the telegraph, da -da -da -da, all that stuff, dot, dot, dash, dash. It's long since in our, maybe in our old memories. He said that in an interview one time, he said, I wasn't the smartest scientist in the world, and there were times when I hit a wall in the invention of all this, and I prayed for God to grant me more light. 
And he chose to do that. I put myself in a position and allowed him to work through me. So the first message that we dot, dot, dash, dashed off was, you remember? What hath God wrought? He said. What is God calling you to do? Now I'm not finished yet. So stick with me just a little bit longer. What Jesus has been doing in the first part of the Sermon on the Mount is to say, beware of other people who may mislead you. What he's doing now is saying, beware of the misleading of yourself, your own self misleading yourself, deceiving yourself into thinking that you're building a house on rock when in reality what you've only gotten down is the words, Lord, Lord. So beware of that, Jesus says. Now, Jesus wouldn't say that if he didn't like you. He loves you. And he desires to know you. He doesn't want you walking around with the only stuff that you got going for you, Christian-wise, is a little attendance at a church, a few passing prayers, a couple of verses floating around up there that may or may not come to your awareness, and no space at all to know Jesus. He wants much more of that for you. And so he asked us to beware. I read a book a while back that I really liked and made it into a movie called Into the Wild about a guy named Christopher McCandless who was really smart, went to Georgia Tech. After he graduated, he tore up his credit cards, gave away his money, burned some of it, gave his car away, and he began to sort of tramp around. And he got real good at it. He actually called himself Alexander Supertramp. Sean Penn made a movie out of it. And the guy ended up dying in a little bus in the frontier areas of Alaska. And when that first came out, there were John Krakow wrote the book, an author I like a lot, and there were articles about this guy. He apparently had lived off stuff and just tramping around the United States for a long time. And he got so good at it that he thought he could go anywhere and face anything and be okay. So he went to Alaska with no map, tennis shoes, boots, a gun, I think 20 pounds of rice, and the guy drove him to the end of the road and let him go. And the guy actually lent him some little boots. He worried about him. The reason he died, in part, is that he had no map to find the little basket that could take you back over the flooded river that in the fall he'd been able to cross easy, but when the snows melt, he couldn't get across it, and he died. You see, sometimes you can deceive yourself. You've done it for so long, and you've been acting like a wise Christian for so long that you maybe even have convinced yourself that that's you. And it may not be. I wrote a poem when I was younger called The Mirror. I don't know if y'all knew I wrote poems, some, every once in a while. They're very private, by the way. <laughs> and ain't much good, but you know, good for the soul. And in the poem, I wrote about the deception of the mirror, which really was my own mind deceiving me, at times deceiving me, saying, you look good. You look real good. You're looking great. That's back when we had those big combs and we keep in the back of our pockets. <laughs> Too many of you are laughing. That's okay. We did that. But mostly what the mirror did for me and continues to do is to show my imperfections and make me feel worse about myself than I rightly should feel. I will look at that and my mind will teach me that that image in the mirror and it will deceive me is an image of a fallen, terrible, ugly human being. Flesh and bones. I'm reminded that we're, the Bible says if your heart condemns you, remember that I'm greater than your heart. Doing the Lord's work includes realizing that when Jesus says, you ought to do something for me, you need to do that. There's a famous statement in one of my history books where the guy says, Baptists for a long time have gotten good at worshiping the hind legs off Jesus by not doing a thing that he says for them to do. And that's the way it is. 
And sometimes, this is the way it will manifest itself. Sometimes your religion will cover over your own sin. Sometimes your activity, the excess of your zeal, you will think that you are the greatest Christian in the world and your self-deception will take over and you will say, pat myself on the back, I'm doing good for you, Jesus. And your zeal, and you will try to do that for others as well, and you will become one of these pushy Christians that we talked about in Sunday school this morning. And sometimes you will deceive yourself into thinking you're moving on the right track. You're doing great. Like the preacher in Georgia, a couple of years ago, television preacher, every bit, and his harshest sermons came just before the uncovering of the affair. Not a good affair, but a bad one. That destroyed him and his ministry and hurt his church. <clears throat> and the tendency I think a lot of us have is that we tend to look at the outside of our lives so much and we judge just like those Pharisees did and those stories of the Bible that were warned against and yet we still do it. If you're being blessed on the outside, you must be doing something right. If you look like you're active, involved in doing stuff, you must be a very devout Christian. And I'm just asking you to say, I don't care how many committees you serve on in the church and how many mission trips you go on, if your heart is not able to bend and you don't know, Lord, Lord, then all that outer stuff to God doesn't matter. You remember he said, I don't desire all your sacrifices and stuff near as much as I desire your heart. I want you. I want who you really are on the inside. Hear what Jesus said? Some folks will be able to say to him, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? That's pretty awesome. Lord, Lord, didn't we cast out demons in your name? That's pretty awesome. Lord, Lord, didn't we do mighty deeds in your name? That's pretty awesome. And Jesus says, you may have done that stuff, but I don't know you, and you don't know me. And I will say to you at the end, get out of here, evil doer. God's blessing our church right now. And it's a good thing. It's, a, it's an awesome thing to me. It's a mighty deed thing to me. And I am constantly reminded of the scripture that said, Pride cometh before the downfall. My uncle used to pray this prayer at the table. And it's a good one for us to remember. May you make us humbly thankful for these and all other blessings, acknowledging the source and being humble to receive what God would bless us with in this church, in this congregation, and in your life. Maybe you should all, all of us, heed the sign that was out of some stores a while back and you'd see it, job, offered, and it would say, if interested, inquire within. If you're interested in Lord, Lord Jesus, I'm just asking you to inquire within. Go to your heart. Things may look good on your outside. Your zeal for the Lord may look awesome. You may be even doing some mighty deeds. I'm just asking you to remember that God is very concerned about you. Peel away all that stuff and look to your heart and see what you see. Not everybody who says to me, Lord, Lord, will make it. Not everyone who does mighty deeds in my name will make it. For if I have not love for Jesus, if I have not devotion for Jesus, if I have no loyalty to Jesus. All of that is like a clanging symbol. There are folks that are good at praising Jesus. They're good at admiring Jesus. And what Jesus really wants is being missed in their lives. I ask you simply to give Him your heart. Give Him your soul. Give Him your mind. And give Him your strength. And while you're doing that, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Clarence Jordan 
who wrote the Cotton Patch Gospels, preached on this passage years and years ago. And he said, according to the ending of the Sermon on the Mount, there are two types of folks. Those who are building their lives on the rock and those who are idiots building it on the sand. Let us now go forth and classify ourselves. Amen. Um, Well, what we always need is a good balanced diet. And so oftentimes you hear from the pulpit the things that I say about His love and grace for us. Part of His love for us is asking us not to fool ourselves into thinking that activity and outward stuff and even right words of confession is enough. If you don't give your heart to Jesus, if you don't know your Lord, and if you don't act, and do the things that your Lord wants you to do. Jesus says you're just fooling yourself. Your life was meant for more than superficiality. Amen. Today we'll have a time for invitation. I just ask all of us to inquire within this morning. If God leads you to come forward to make a decision public, like joining our church or accepting Christ as your Savior or rededicating yourself or just want to come pray, we got time. So please do that if that's what the Lord lays on your heart this morning. Let us stand as we say. 436, why the Today, uh, I want to remind you that next week, since we have Bible school, our Bible school commence will be Sunday morning, and we'll be meeting out in the CMC in our new building at the stage area there. So that's where we'll be for church uh, next Sunday morning, okay? All right, y'all have a good week. Roy? Have a great day. See you back tonight.